Hi, and welcome to this session BP1281, SUSE Rancher and Kubernetes Secrets Use Case, How to Encrypt Your Data in the Cloud. I'm thrilled to be your host for today, and during the next 30 minutes or so, we're going to be talking about key topics when adopting a multi-cloud or hybrid cloud strategy um, around privacy and end-to-end -end data encryption. So the talk is going to be focused around Kubernetes because it's perceived as the de facto cloud operating system that allows you to keep a cloud agnostic strategy across the board. Because as soon as you're running Kubernetes, then you can run it anywhere and use the same strategy, the same uh, technique to encrypt your data regardless of the location. And so for this, we're going to be starting by taking a look at secrets in Kubernetes, what they are, uh, what are their characteristics, uh, their caveats. Then we're going to take a look at how to encrypt your cloud native data. So the data that you are using in Kubernetes uh, by using Kubernetes native paradigms, because as soon as you um, deploy Kubernetes and start using it, you want to keep as much as possible, you want to keep tools within Kubernetes so you can keep this kind of um, agnosticity for your tool set across you know, many different um, environments, many different clouds. Then uh, we're going to be introducing Truso, an open source project that will allow you to use any external KMS provider and make it operate the Kube native way. So in that particular instance, we're going to show you how to integrate it with SUSE Rancher, and then we'll conclude by a demo. So let's get started. My name is Nick Vermundi. I'm a principal developer advocate with Ondat, and I've been working with Kubernetes for approximately the past six years in various companies. So Cisco, mostly working on the CNI, Container Network Interface, and nowadays with Ondat more uh, focused on the CSI, Container storage interface and you know, the corresponding data services. So in our first topic, uh, let's take a look at Kubernetes secrets. There are different ways to store application data in Kubernetes. Um, as you know, um, when you migrate or create a new application, develop a new application within Kubernetes, you're not supposed to hard code application parameters and contextual data you should use Kubernetes primitives to do so. And there are a couple of them that will help you. So first, config maps. So config maps are key value pairs that you can mount in Kubernetes as volumes for your pods or as environment variables. Then uh, you have obviously data that you, if you want to store data for a particular application, maybe a stateful application, then you can use Kubernetes volumes that will make use of local or uh, remote um, storage disks. Then we have what we call the downward API. So the downward API gives you this ability um, to add specific container and pods field into your manifests. So for example, you may want to dynamically uh, inject the IP address of a pod or any sort of dynamic context contextual information that you want to make available for uh, your containers, you can use the Donwall API. So again, Donwall API, you can use it as environment variable or you can mount it as volumes. And finally, we have secrets. So secrets on paper, they really look like config maps, but with a few differences. Let's take a look at them. If we look at config maps on your left, we see that there is a data section where you can find the key value pair. So game.properties would be the key. And then you can find a set of different parameters. Same thing for the ui.properties key. Everything is in clear text uh, and easily accessible. For secret though, you can see there's also a data section with the same keys but the values are not directly readable. But is it really encrypted? Well, no, it's encoded, which is different 
from encrypted. Anyone with you know, the, the proper command line can encode and decode messaging. Um, they share the same encoding properties. So this uh, example show you how to decode the string that we've shown before. And the content is actually exactly the same as for the config map. So both config map and secrets are not encrypted. The only difference is that config map are in clear text, but secrets are encoded in base64. So now the question is, should you treat secrets as config maps? And if you want to store sensitive information in secrets, why should you care about your you know, secret security? Well, a couple of reasons. First, any user who has read permission on secrets within a given namespace can, re can read all secrets within that namespace. Right? Anyone with read permission for etcd, which is where Kubernetes is storing all the objects, so including secrets, um, can read all secrets in the cluster, right? So you want to get your secrets encrypted in etcd, which is what we are uh, gonna focus after. And finally, anyone who can connect to a pod associated with a service account that has read permission for secrets can read all secrets in a given namespace. This is kind of the same thing as the first point, except that um, you know, a standard user, this is a service account that is used within the container to access um, you know, Kubernetes objects and Kubernetes control plane objects. So how to remediate um, these this issues? Well, first apply the least privilege principle for your users, your Kubernetes users, then encrypt secrets at rest in etcd. Also, you want to secure all the etcd members. So typically this is all your control plane nodes. Um, so the, the, the communication between this member should be using TLS. And then finally, you want to limit etcd access altogether to reduce the attack surface from your uh, control plane by using um, stateful firewall rules where you can. Now that we have clarified secrets, uh, their challenges and their importance in Kubernetes, let's take a look at the data themselves and how to encrypt cloud native data. But when we talk about cloud native data, what does that really mean? For this, let's take at the anatomy of a stateful workload or stateful application in Kubernetes. In that particular example, this is a Redis database. So at the foundation, when you want to deploy a database or any stateful workload in Kubernetes, you will use a dedicated controller, uh, which is a stateful set. So that's a um, first class citizen object in Kubernetes, which has a um, which has a couple of properties. So every pod member of a stateful set will have predictable names starting in ordinal numbers uh, starting with zero. So uh, for example, here with a three node cluster for um, the Redis um, leader, you would end up with the first pod, which will be maybe you know, Redis leader dash zero, and then the second one dash one, dash two, etc. cetera. Uh, what is very particular to stateful sets is that um, the way, uh, the way they, they, they provide um, storage and volumes is different from traditional pods. So with a stateful set, you have a particular statement, which is called a volume claim template that allows you to uh, provision individual PVC, so persistent volume claim, as well as persistent volume on a per pod basis. So every pod, and in turn, every, in that case, every Redis node will have its own individual volume. And typically, how you provision volume in Kubernetes is via a dynamic storage class, which is one of the most common way, or, and the, most of the most, one of the most simple way to, um, to provision. And by, just defining your storage requirements and specifying a storage class then the, and creating the PVC 
the backend volume will be created automatically. Right? So in the end, you end up with um, what is displayed on that screen. You have the storage class that is managing um, the storage um, provisioning for a particular you know, set of pod as part of the stateful sets. You create your PVCs, you link the PVCs to the storage class, and then by creating this link, uh, Kubernetes will know that this is a particular you know, storage backend that is going to be used and bound to the, the various pods. And basically the storage class is where you want to enable extra features. So by default, encryption, you know, replication, compression, caching, all these data services are not available in Kubernetes by default, right? So um, it means that you have to use another uh, component, an external component to provide these services, including for encryption. And at the beginning, the various storage capabilities can be plugged into Kubernetes by using what we call Kubernetes CSI or the container storage interface. This is a standard that has been defined for storage plugin back in 2018. And before that, Kubernetes um, used to have the um, storage drivers included in the core code, so in tree. So Kubernetes moved away from this model um, to define APIs and RPCs that enable dynamic provisioning and the provisioning of a volume, attaching, detaching, mounting and mounting, creating and deleting snapshots, as well as provi uh, provisioning a new volume for a uh, from, from a snapshot, so essentially cloning. All of these features are um, high-level functions that are expected from Kubernetes and implemented by uh, storage vendors. And essentially now, uh, Kubernetes CSI is just another application that you can install onto your Kubernetes uh, cluster. So typically it will be composed of a daemon set, so an agent per node, as well as some control plane components. Then in addition to um, the CSI basic features, storage vendor may provide um, additional capabilities and expose this to the user uh, by you know, a particular uh, parameters or label um, for storage class and PVC. So you can decorate storage class and PVC with additional uh, parameters that will then be synced with the uh, storage provider control plane, and then uh, in turn is going to enable this feature uh, in their own you know, uh, feature set. So for example, here this is um, on that storage class where you can enable particular uh, on that feature by using key value pairs as parameters. So here we have a uh, number of replicas that is set to two, encryption that is simply enabled by using the, the Boolean true. Same thing with topology aware, which allows you to uh, spread your replica, uh, your replicas across multiple availability zones. Um, on top of this, there's also um, a, another CSI, uh, open source CSI, that is called the secret store CSI driver that allows you uh, to encrypt and mount secrets from external KMS provider directly as part volume. So the secrets lifecycle is essentially managed outside of Kubernetes and they are not stored directly in Kubernetes, although you can, uh, there's an option to synchronize them, um, but um, it does not encrypt objects stored inside, inside Kubernetes etcd. Multiple providers are supported, such as HashiCorp Vote, um, AWS KMS, Google Cloud KMS, as well as Azure KMS. Um, and finally, also the, the changes that you are going to make um, to those secrets in the external um, store, they won't be reflected in the mounted volume as the pod is running. It's only uh, because it's only sets um, at pod when the pod is started. So any update, subsequent update won't be reflected um, into, um, into the pod mounted volume. Ideally, you want the best of both worlds. On the one side, you want to encrypt your secrets within an CD, but at the same time, you want a Kubernetes native way of doing so. So let's take a look at how to encrypt uh, resources at rest with Kubernetes. 
This is achieved via what we call an encryption configuration manifest, where you specify what resources you want to encrypt, decrypt, as well as the providers. And there are two family of providers, let's say. You can um, use static keys or you can use external, uh, an external key management system to manage the life cycle of those keys. So using the static keys, obviously, as you can see on the screen, they are displayed in clear text within that encryption configuration manifest, which means that anyone with access to that particular file will be able to decrypt all the secrets that are stored, all the, all the resources that are stored uh, into Kubernetes. So in that particular example, we see that the only resource we want to encrypt is secrets, which is the most um, common use case, although you could encrypt other object, ob other object if you wish so. Um, the external key management system has um, another a couple of parameters. So you're going to define the name of the plugin as well as the endpoint, uh, which is the listen address for the gRPC server. So then Kubernetes will be talking to that particular um, you know, socket process using uh, gRPC. And that particular uh, KMS provider needs to support the Kubernetes envelope encryption scheme, which is using both a data encryption key used to encrypt the data in combination with a key encryption key that is used to encrypt the data encryption key. So this is available for any Kubernetes distribution, but if you need a more uh, secure uh, distribution, SUSE Rancher provides OK2, the next generation Kubernetes engine, also known as uh, RKE government, uh, which provide a couple of extra security features and will pass um, CIS 1.5 and 1.6 ben benchmarks by, by default. So it is a, an upstream confirmed community distribution, uh, cloud provider agnostic, you can install it in any cloud, you can install it on premises, and um, the overall management can be centralized with Rancher server. It also supports modern CNI meta plugin like Multus, which allow you to chain multiple CNI if you need multiple interfaces within your containers. It does provide a support for air gap deployment where you don't have any uh, internet connectivity. Container D as a replacement for Docker, which is a good thing since Docker Shim has been uh, deprecated uh, some time ago. Also have compliance with FIPS 140-2, which is a standard to approve uh, cryptographic modules. And finally, it's a very simple um, install process if you want to do it manually as opposed you know, from the, as from the Rancher server. It, does, um, it is aligned with the K3S model. So single binary for server and agent, and then you just uh, join the agent to the cluster. So quite simple. Um, in terms of encryption, etcd um, encryption is enabled by default in RK2, um, where RK2 sets um, on the API server encryption provider config um, you know, to, to a specific file where you can find the encryption configuration. However, it does use static keys, uh, which has the issue we mentioned before. So they are in clear text and you need a way to manage potentially rotation uh, of the keys yourself. So um, how can we solve that particular problem? Here come Trousseau. Trousseau acts as a KMS proxy between uh, the Kubernetes API server and the backend KMS provider. So if we look at Vault, uh, Vault initially without um, Trousseau will have its own way of managing secrets for Kubernetes using a sidecar model within the application. So the, the, the secrets are not managed within Kubernetes at all. And then Trousseau will allow you to make Vault or to turn Vault into a compliant um, Kubernetes KMS provider because now it will use through Trousseau uh, the, the uh, envelope encryption scheme and will be directly connected to the Kube API server. So it allows you um, to use external KMS provider but without the drawbacks of managing them outside of Kubernetes. So the process um, to encrypt and decrypt secrets with Trousseau is described on the right um, in, your, um, in the picture there. So first the user is gonna create um, a secret 
and send it to the Kube API server. Then the Kube API server uh, will talk to Trusso via gRPC, Trusso acting as the um, gRPC server we've mentioned before. Then uh, Trusso will take that particular request, encrypt or decrypt, and send it to the one of the KMS provider that will have uh, that you will have configured. So today it only support vaults, but we have uh, other you know plans to we have plans to also integrate with other KMS provider like cloud providers, for example. And vault then will make use of a transit key. So that key is not stored in Kubernetes at all. It is just managed outside of Kubernetes uh, in vault. And vault also won't store the encrypted result. So the encrypted secret um, will be transient in Vault, right? So uh, Trusso will send the request to Vault. Vault encrypts or decrypt the secret using its transit key, send it back to Trusso, and then Trusso will send again the result back to the Kube API server. And in the case of encryption, then the Kube API server will store the encrypted secret within the etcd store. So how do you configure it with RK2? It's quite simple. Um, the init um, you know, the uh, initialization file, the encryption-config.json should be uh, left empty. And then you change uh, the config.yaml file to point to the new encryption config file that defines how to use Trusso as the Unix domain socket. And that's enough theory for today. Let's jump into a quick demo. So in this environment, I already have deployed a Kubernetes cluster and um, created the configuration with Trusso. And in terms of uh, the storage class, I've got uh, uh, on that encrypted storage class that I want to show you on that encrypted. And you can see that um, here encryption has been enabled. So any um, PVC consuming that storage class will have its data encrypted and um, a secret will be created on a per volume basis in, within the namespace where the PVC is deployed. And that secret uh, will represent the uh, key that is used to, creep, to encrypt and decrypt that volume. So I also have deployed a stateful set um, a MongoDB stateful set, so a database, a three node cluster. And you can see that for um, every node, so node zero, one, and two, I have um, two volumes per, per um, MongoDB nodes, one for data and one for logs. And also as expected, you see that I have um, one secrets per a volume. So I've got total six volume, and total six secrets. Now, what I want to see is um, the secrets unencrypted. So um, again, if I do, let's use the first secrets here and check that you know it's not encrypted using kubectl because I'm an admin, an admin secrets here there. I should see it unencrypted, right? So I've got the data there. Uh, everything is fine. It's just um, base uh, 64 uh, encoded, as you can see. Now I want to check that within etcd, it is still uh, encrypted by vault. So for that, uh, I'm going to use the etctl um, command and I'm going to use um, the location of that particular object within uh, etcd and checked the content uh, using an x dump to check um, what is visible there. And if I go at the very top here, I can see that this is gibberish here. This is the, the text. So it is effectively encrypted. And the proof is at the very beginning here is going to tell you that this is encrypted with a KMS and vault provider, which is available through Trousseau. So as a result, now all my secrets are effectively encrypted within Kubernetes and vault is using its transit key uh, to realize the encrypt and decrypt operation thanks to Trousseau, which is acting as a man in the middle. This demo concludes our talk for today. 
Uh, but just before leaving, I just wanted to highlight a couple of key takeaways um, that we've been talking about. So first off, secrets are not encrypted at rest by default in Kubernetes. You need to find a way to do it uh, by your own uh, means. And the only way to decouple data encryption from cloud providers is to use a Kubernetes CSI that supports volume encryption. You cannot rely on cloud providers to do end-to-end -end encryption. And as soon as you're using more than one, then you will have to learn a new KMS and potentially new APIs, uh, etc. So um, using a Kubernetes CSI that supports volume encryption allows you to become cloud agnostic and to keep the same encryption mechanism end to end. In terms of Kubernetes distribution, we've seen that RKE2, which is RKE government, encrypts etcd by default. Uh, however, it's making use of static keys, which is not ideal. To alleviate this problem, um, you can use Trousseau, which is an OSS project that delivers a KMS proxy that makes um, any backend KMS provider Kubernetes native, right? And that supports this an envelope encryption, encryption scheme uh, that is uh, expected by Kubernetes. I hope you enjoyed the rest of the conference. Take care of yourself and see you soon.